Good afternoon. Um, you've arrived after the God particle. After seems to be the word of this year. We're after everything. The discovery of the Higgs boson, dubbed at the time as the God particle, was um, celebrated worldwide back then um, as an explanation for mass itself. It seemed like we actually explained something really fundamental. Yeah, we did. <laughs> <laughs> I knew we shouldn't have invited him. But they, didn't, they, didn't, they didn't listen. Um, but all is not well, John. Uh, there is now talk at CERN of what some people are calling the nightmare scenario. Uh, because, simply because there haven't been that many new discoveries that might enable them to make an elegant theory, to make sense of a current chaos, a chaos of lots and lots of particles and innumerable, an infinite number of universes which the theories say they need. So, this has led some people to wonder, well, should we just abandon supersymmetry and string theory and all of the other attempts to provide the much promised theory of everything? Or, so was the Higgs a step towards this, this um, alleged theory of everything? Or is the theory behind it, and in fact, particle physics itself, in real trouble? So to help us wade our way through that, we have on my right, Catherine Heyman. Catherine is the Professor of Astrophysics of European Research Council Fellow at the University of Edinburgh. You're based at the Institute of Astronomy, aren't you? Mm -hmm. I am, yeah. An astronomer, thank goodness, thank God we got an astronomer. <laughs> She's the first winner of the new Max Planck Humboldt Award uh, for her research into dark energy. And is perhaps best known for her techniques of trying to extract the information about the nature of the universe from our actual observations. Um, to my left, Ben Alanak is a professor at the Department of Applied Mathematics and Theoretical Physics at Cambridge University. And also, I'd just like to get this on record, something of a wild man, if you agree to go out clubbing with him. <laughs> and uh, whatever you may have read in the local press, it was his fault and I have witnesses. <laughs> and then we have our resident troublemaker, John Ellis, Maxwell Prize winning theoretical physicist who since 1978 has been the man keeping CERN running because he's the only person who understands how it works. Uh, he's made important contributions uh, in many fields of inquiry, including particle physics, astrophysics, cosmology, and um, writes very good pantomimes. <laughs> but we won't go into that. Um, why has it gone quiet at CERN? Am I kicking off? Yeah, please. How exciting. Okay. <laughs> um, so I'm, I'm slightly different from our two other panel members here in that I'm an astrophysicist. And that means I question the universe on much larger distances, time and mass scales than my two particle physics colleagues here. I'm also an experimentalist. Uh, so I go out and I observe the universe and I extract as much information as I possibly can to confront the different theories that um, my theoretical colleagues here on my left come up with. Um, now, my specialist area is uh, called dark matter. Uh, now, if uh, you are happy to believe that Einstein's theory of general relativity fully describes gravity, then there has to be invisible matter out there in the universe and indeed in this very room. Um, now, I can tell you where that dark matter is. I can tell you how much dark matter there is. There's roughly about five times as much dark matter as there is the stuff that we're made up of. I can tell you that the dark matter can only act very, very weakly with the stuff that we're made up of, might not even interact at all. But I can't tell you what the dark matter particle is. And for two decades now, I have been waiting for our particle physics cousins to either catch one of these elusive dark matter particles in these deep underground vats of very heavy elements, um, or create one of these particles at the Large Hadron Collider at CERN. I am still waiting. Um, now, whilst I've been waiting, I've also been watching and there have been some amazing technological advances. It is absolutely phenomenal what they can do at CERN now. They are recreating the conditions or some of the conditions that it was like around the Big Bang. It is phenomenal what they are doing. But that experiment was benchmarked on a theory that we're going to be discussing today, supersymmetry, uh, that predicted that not only would CERN discover the Higgs boson, but it would also discover these supersymmetric particles, which uh, John was one of the first people to predict would be an excellent candidate for the dark matter that I seek. 
Um, and so, of course, it's very disappointing that CERN hasn't found these particles yet. Um, but I take issue with the question, why has it gone quiet at CERN? Because that would suggest that they haven't been doing anything, and that's simply not true. There's been huge amounts of advances since that discovery of the Higgs boson in trying to really understand the science behind the Higgs boson. And from that, we might learn more about this overarching theory that we're going to discuss further today. I'd like to say the question was just based on an old football chant. OK, fine. That's OK. It's all gone quiet over there. Um, <laughs> ben, why has it gone quiet over there? <laughs> right. Yeah, CERN's a very noisy place, as you know. So, um, no, I, I've spent my whole career working on supersymmetry until last year. And the fact that um, supersymmetric particles haven't been found at CERN has made me uh, reevaluate the supersymmetry theory. Um, and I, for now, um, I'm not working on it. I'm working on other things. I'm looking for glitches in the data and trying to work in a more bottom up way from the data uh, in a theoretical direction rather than what I used to do, which was work on some of these uni unified theories um, which use supersymmetry as a bridge to get to low energies. So the problem with that what way... What does that mean? Sorry, Ben. Well, OK. So uh, the, the reason that we thought that the Large Hadron Collider should be able to produce supersymmetric particles is because supersymmetry explains why the Higgs boson isn't really heavy. <laughs> OK? So the Higgs boson is a very particular particle. It's sensitive to mass. It explains how elementary particles get their mass. But it's very sensitive to quantum fluctuations. You know, the vacuum isn't really empty space. It's a seething, boiling mass of particles. And the Higgs boson is very sensitive. It's particularly sensitive to those. And if you do a back of the envelope calculation, you see that its mass should be about, um, about a billion, billion times the mass of a proton and it's only 100 times the mass of a proton. So this is a puzzle, and we don't understand the answer, and supersymmetry was the, was the answer. And is this why you're now so not, that's why not I was so, signed up? That's, that, I was so enthused ab about it that uh, I thought, well, let's try and help uh, see how we could discover it. But then it wasn't, you know, we, we know that to some degree um, that it's not there, it's not light enough. It doesn't solve this problem very well, at least. So, I've, so for me now, um, the way that I can make progress more is to work in the other way and looking elsewhere at the, at the data to, um, you know, for example, at uh, there are these particles called bottom mesons. They seem to be decaying with the wrong frequencies comparing to the, compared to the standard model of particle physics. For me, that's an opportunity. So we've invented a new quantum force, theoretically, that could describe why these bottom mesons are decaying in this weird way. And then we're trying to look for other signals of our... You've of our actually in, proposed a new force of the universe. Have you mentioned this to anyone? <laughs> yeah, we published a few papers. Oh, good. We're not the only ones, I must say. There okay. are competing uh, theories. But one of the things we do is to try and uh, suggest ways that you can sieve the data uh, and new measurements that you can make in order to be able to tell which theory is correct. But, it meant, but suggesting a new force, that's quite a big thing, isn't it? Um, um, it is. Quite a bold step. It's a bold step, but um, actually it's one that many of us have uh, taken. It's become more common uh, recently. It's, you know, it's really, all you have to do is invent a new U1 gauge theory uh, multiplied by the standard model and spontaneously break it, no problem. <laughs> I'm Easy. sure many of you have, but um, <laughs> <laughs> John. <laughs> okay, John, go on. So ha I take it it hasn't actually gone quiet at CERN, or do you take some of the... Because Ben sounds like a boy who was promised something for Christmas and then didn't get it. Yeah, well, I'm sorry about that, Ben. No, maybe next Christmas. <laughs> yeah, so uh, it hasn't... So, so let's step all the way back. How does science progress? So, so science does not progress you know, at a constant rate. Uh, it sort of goes along fairly slowly for a while, and then maybe there's some big discovery or some great new insight, and it makes a jump. And you know, as Kuhn said, you've got a new paradigm right there. And so you know, there's periods of uh, sort of accumulative data taking. Uh, and then you've got periods where there's you know, something suddenly changes very rapidly. And so for me, the Higgs boson was, was just such a rapid change. Uh, you know, we had been, you know, for almost 50 years trying to figure out where the hell particle masses ca came from. You know, Peter Higgs had this uh, crazy idea, or at least it seemed crazy initially. Then as time went on, people crossed off all the other ideas. And, you know, 
Higgs was pretty much the only guy left standing, and there it was. There it was the Higgs boson. Uh, so, so that gave us a great leap forward in our understanding of the nature work, the way nature works. But, but then, you know, of course, then, you know, things move more slowly. What we're currently doing is, you know, a little bit like what Catherine and Ben described. You know, we're studying in great detail the properties of the Higgs boson to see whether it really is, well, the Higgs boson or some imposter. Uh, we're looking to see whether, you know, maybe it's not quite behaving in the same way that the standard model describes, or whether it's behaving in a way described, for example, by supersymmetry. But, but maybe I, somebody should say what supersymmetry yeah. is, right? Oh, can, uh, you do it, can you do it easily? Uh, <laughs> do you want to know what supersymmetry is? Yes. John, the floor is yours. Okay. <laughs> so so, so the, way, the way that theoretical physics works. To continue watching this video, click the link in the top left or in the description below. Or visit iai.tv for more debates and talks from the world's leading thinkers on today's biggest ideas.